this presentation pretty much follows on from the last one. It was going to be too long, so I cut it in half. And so this one deals with what we call the Ediacaran fauna. In fact, there's a guy who discovered the Ediacaran fauna. And I'm going to tell you a little story about him. His name is Reg Sprig. And uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how people look at fossils. We're going to talk about taxonomy and systematics. And then we're going to talk about fossils and evolution just a little bit. And we're going to cover fossils in a little bit more detail in a later uh, presentation here. And then we're going to talk about these Ediacaran uh, fossils that first show up. And they predated this huge blooming of life on this planet that we we have come to know as the Cambrian uh, explosion. And so it's not really an explosion. It was just this proliferation of life across, well, across the entire world roughly at the same time. And so that's what they call the Cambrian explosion. So for this one, this is just a, a brief blooming of life on this planet after the cryogenian. So after a climate change back to warmer conditions again, we have this, this chance to regrow essentially. So let me introduce you to Reg Sprig, okay, Reginald Claude Sprig. Um, he's from Australia. He's a mem well, he was awarded the Order of Australia Medal for this, and he was also a fellow of the Technical Institute for Sciences and Engineering, and he lived from 1919 to 1994. He was the discoverer of the Ediacaran fauna in the Flinders Range of South Australia. So Australia. It's a big continent, not as big as the United States, you know, roughly the size of the United States. So if you can imagine an area the size of Texas, that's what he was working in. And it has this mountain range called the Flinders Range. He was actually working partially in the Ediacaran Hills as well. And that's what the fauna are named after. In fact, we're going to call it the Ediacaran fauna. I'll let that slip every once in a while, but really it's the Ediacaran uh, biota because we're not sure if they're actually animals, some of these things. Some of them may have been plants. And some of them may have been even fungi. So it's hard to know which one of these that these things are because all we have are the fossils and we have to make interpretations then off of what the fossil, what do you think it is? Well, what does it look like, right? And so we try to use the modern animals to interpret what we see in the ancient past, but that's not always a good thing to do because there are plenty of things that have gone extinct over the over the last 500 million years and we may not have any of these creatures around anymore, so trying to figure out what they are becomes a real problem. Red Sprig was mapping in the Flinders Range, and he stopped for lunch one day. And he's looking around, and he sees these fossils down on the ground. It's like, well, that's kind of weird. These aren't supposed to be Cambrian age. And he immediately thought, just because he saw a fossil in these rocks, it must be Cambrian in age. He actually collected a whole bunch of these rocks. Okay, so it's not an accident. He actually started looking for fossils in the rocks that were in the Flinders Range and also in the, the Ediacaran Hills. And he finds these fossils. And it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. So he writes up, and he's like, I think these are jellyfishes. And so he writes this thing up for the journal Nature. Now, if you don't know, Nature London is the most prestigious journal you can pretty much publish in. Um, this because I had a British advisor when I was in graduate school, okay? So nature is pretty big. Um, in the United States, we like to think that the journal Science is maybe just as good. It's published by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS. In Nature London, they're their own entity, and they publish things as well. So they publish the cutting-edge science. So they're on par with one another. So if you see a science article or if you see a nature article, it's like those are really pretty good and vetted articles. Well, they rejected his article. They said, oh, we don't need to hear about like jellyfishes in the Cambrian, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like we've seen these before. So they rejected his paper. And as they began to map more and more of these things, it's like, well, I've seen things like this before. Now, this fossil right here is actually Charnia masoni, and it was not described by Reg Sprig. Okay, so Reg Sprig was working in the late 1940s and 1950, roughly, when he tried to publish in Nature. 1958, Ford published on this, this strange creature. It had not been found in the Flinders Range, but it wasn't too long before they found it in the Flinders Range as well. 
this charnia, if you look at it carefully, it's got segments on it. It looks like it's got, you know, some sort of like cluster or almost like a leaf almost, if you will. When it was first found, it was found by a guy named Roger Mason. So Roger Mason was a friend or, or, or at least a young uh, student in Ford. He, he said, showed it to Ford. And actually the first description of this fossil was based on a, a rubbing essentially that this young guy, Mr. Mason, had done over this fossil and says, take a look at this. And I found this in a rock. Show me where it's at. And so they went out there and they collected it. And today this is in the Leicester uh, Museum and actually art gallery as well. So in the Leicester Museum, you can actually see what's called the holotype for that actual specimen of Charnia masoni. And so Leicester's in, in Britain, the UK, of course. There were Precambrian rocks in Britain, in other words. They didn't know they were Precambrian at the time. So along came a guy named Martin Glazner. Glazner came along and he says, ah, I think these are actually not what you think they are. And he actually wrote it up uh, about these things, got it published. And he named some of the fossils actually for Sprigg. But he got some of the story wrong because Sprigg intentionally set out to find those fossils. They weren't by accident at all. And so I think Sprig was kind of bent out of shape. It's like, why didn't you, why did you say that? You know, um, but first, before we go on, notice that the Charnia masoni in this, in this image, in this slide, in fact, is italicized. There's a reason for that because that's known as a binomen. A binomen consists of the genus and the species, the specific name, and then with systematics, they do this, this these days. They haven't always done this, but today when you, when you name something, they usually put the author of that name afterwards in the year that was actually described, and, you know, for where that paper and where, where it was described. So Ford was the author. 1958 was the year that he published on it. And Charnia masoni is the name of the genus and species. So the species itself is called Charnia masoni. That is the species. It consists of two parts of a name. Binomen, meaning two names. And so the two names, Charnia, which is the genus, and then Charnia masoni, that's the name of the species. So a little background on this. It was a Swede, in fact, who came up with this sort of system. He called it the, the taxonomic uh, no, binomen, if you will. or But he, he wrote Systema Nature, Naturi, Naturi. And so Carolus Linnaeus, and it's not his real name, but in fact, it was Carol, I, I don't remember what it was, Carlos, Carl something or other, but he was a Swede. And many of the Swedes would, you know, many of the learned peoples of the 1700s would actually Latinize their, their names. It sounds a little pretentious to us today, but if you recall, there was Nicholas Steno also, right? So his name was also Latinized um, to indicate that he was, a binomen in and of himself, okay? So in this case, he proposed the idea we should name things with two parts because we recognize that some species are related to other parts. They may share a common genus, in other words. And so genus is this sort of abstract idea that there's a belongingness between two species, but in fact, the principal unit of evolution is the species itself. Those That's where the dynamics are going on in evolution. So genus is that abstraction of how we think things are related to one another. So the binomen is the genus and species. If that's taxonomy, naming the creatures, we identify them or we try to describe them and you name them, that's the taxonomy. The systematics is actually looking at the relationship. And so we have various tools that we use for looking at systematics. And so those tools, we may talk about them later in here, but it's not really the focus of this class. But if you had DNA sequencing of two different organisms that are what you think are closely related to one another, their genomes are going to be almost identical, but they may vary a little bit. Okay, so you can do DNA analysis or DNA sequencing in order to get at the connectedness between organisms. You can't do that with fossils because fossils are just the remains of the animal. In most cases, they were the hard part remains, but we didn't have that back in the Ediacaran. There are no skeletons preserved. So most of the fossils that are in the Ediacaran, they're what we call soft body preservation. Soft body preservation effects are the impressions that these things make in between a top bedding surface and a bottom bedding surface. And so 
but you can still do some other things with fossils, and cladistics is one of those things. So cladistics you can use in living organisms, and you can also use it in fossil uh, organisms as well. What common characteristics do these fossils share? And so that's what cladistics does. It compares the characters or the characteristics of certain fossils. And then you can also do statistics, right? So is, does this shell look the same as that shell? And you can actually measure every little aspect of a shell and look at a variance covariance uh, chart to see how it differs from its outlying groups, right? And so statistics is very commonly used in looking at the differences in evolution and how we look at systematics, in fact, as well. So not only do we have a species, which is the fundamental unit of evolution, we also have the genus, which is that abstract concept about how we think one species is related to another, and we put them under the same umbrella. For instance, for human beings, we have Homo erectus, right? And But we also have the species that we are. Yeah, which is not Homo habilis, but it's, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ones, but we are Homo sapiens, right? So the ones that are the intelligent ones and so forth, we think anyway. So all of these things are related by the genus Homo, but in fact, the the species name for us is Homo, species, uh, Homo sapiens. And so um, that's that's the fundamental unit of our evolution. In fact, even though we have some genes from you know, Homo neanderthalensis, and we also have some from Denosovans, and I don't think they've actually classified Denosovans uh, yet, really. Uh, and But if you get beyond the genus, that concept, and you get beyond the species, which is the two names, and then also above that, you can have relatedness as well. How does this genus compare with that genus? Those two genera, which is the plural form of genus, not genuses, so genera, those two genera may in fact be related to one another as well within a family. And so there's this hierarchy that people began to think of. And it's like, well, how are we all related to one another? And so family became the next one that we look at. Uh, above that sort of level and above that we have order and then there's class and then phylum and then kingdom. And then above kingdom, there's even uh, another one that we call domain. Now, there's actually three recognized domains today, uh, and that would be the archaea, the bacteria, and then the eukaryota, essentially. Those are the three domains that we have. And a realm is kind of related to that, but it only refers to the viruses. So viruses go under the the top heading of do, of realm, in fact. But under domain, there's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And so there used to be an acronym, King Philip something or other. Uh, but, you know, you could memorize that sort of classification. But I want you to know that it's an arbitrary concept based on perceived, or it maybe even there's evidence for it, right? So there may be evidence for it, but it's still an abstraction of what is reality because the fundamental unit of evolution is, in fact, the species. So species will appear and then disappear through time. They may give rise to other species. That's a different sort of, it's called speciation. So that's a different sort of idea. And if you give rise to another species, that means that it was related to its ancestral species as well. Well, cladistics can kind of help you get to that, but there's, in other words, there's no missing link, but there is shared common ancestry. So that's the idea behind cladistics is to get it shared common ancestry. So there are customs for dealing with the binomen as well. So if you'll notice so far what you've seen with, inst for instance, the Charnia um, masoni, it's all uh, italicized, right? And so you can either italicize it or you underline it, but to indicate that it is actually a species, that's what you have to do. You have to give it a different typeface, in other words. So we give it, uh, you know, the italicized version, or you can underline it to indicate that it's a species as well. Um, and then sometimes we abbreviate uh, the genus. And so if we were to look at Homo sapiens, rather than writing your entire paper and having to repeat that all the time, you would just say H sapiens. And so H period sapiens, but still with the italics or with the underlining and so forth. Um, other things that people do when you don't recognize what specific name or where it should be assigned to what species, Oftentimes, you know it may belong to a certain genus, but it doesn't necessarily belong to the type species of that genus or that the, the type species of that genus. So, so in fact, it would be 
SP or spur is what they refer to it as. So SP refers to a species, unknown what it is. There's a whole bunch of different things that people, uh, the, the hoops that people jump through. This is probably one of the reasons why I didn't become a taxonomist, uh, because there are so many different rules that govern this, and they're all governed, in fact, by biologists pretty much, and it's called the North American Code for Zoologic Nomenclature. And so the NACZN is the source for how you go about naming things, and there's a whole nother system for like saying, well, which one has priority? Because maybe you could find a fossil that somebody has never described before. You would name it. But if somebody came along and said, no, 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 that's the same fossil that such and such described back then, you would be the junior synonym of that fossil and you would have to change the name. And the other person would then become the author for that uh, name, even though your species may be different. If your species is different, you'll get authorship for that, perhaps. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different rules that go into this. But the word holotype is another word, right? So in fossils, if you find the first fossil of something, that becomes the holotype for that, or at least it's the one that you may designate as a holotype. It is the one to which every other fossil would be compared to see if it actually is that species. So you want to pick a really good one that shows all the characters that you think are important in it. So that is a holotype. Holotypes are important in in uh, paleontology because you have to go back and compare things to see things. So you look in the publication first. If you still aren't convinced, you have to go and visit that museum where it's actually held in the collections. And sometimes they go missing. So sometimes there has to be a designated replacement for that holotype and that becomes known as a lectotype. So there's all this burdensome sort of like language that goes along with taxonomy that I really didn't want to deal with when I was dealing with paleontology. But it's important to know, at least parts of it anyway, it's important to know. So if that's part two of our background, part three of our background are the systematics and the systematics require a citation for that author. And we've already kind of talked about this. So Ford discovered this thing from the research that that Roger Mason did. And he's going to name it after Mason. So he's going to call it Masonite. That's very common in the literature. So for instance, when it comes to Sprig, Reg Sprig, there's at least two different genera that are named after Reg Sprig. One of them's called Sprigina, and the other one's called Sprigi. But they're different kinds of organisms, and so they have two different uh, generic names. But uh, anyway, this actually has a holotype in the Leicester Museum and the uh, art gallery, and it was later found in the uh, Flinders Range after this. And so, but in fact, most fossils just like the living organisms have a binomen as well. And so we followed that same sort of pattern that biologists had done all the way back in the 1700s. So not only for the fossils themselves, but also for other various types of things that are regarded as fossils, we call them trace fossils. So trace fossils, in fact, are burrows, tracks, uh, borings, all sorts of anything where an animal can leave its mark in sedimentary successions. It's called ichno, ichno, uh, ichnology is the name of the study of these traces, but they're made by animals and we know that, or plants, right? So it could be a plant root that, you know, that gets named a certain trace fossil name. They're called ichno species then, in fact. So there's ichno genera and ichno species, okay? As far as I know, there's no ichno families, but uh, but there are families, in fact, of some of these sorts of organisms, I'm pretty sure anyway. So uh, for every species, it has a holotype or should have a holotype. It also has a type area where it was found. The type area for Charnia then would be in Britain. Uh, genera also have what we call type species, right? So the type species for Charnia, which was named for the Charnwood Hill or Charnwood Forest. The Charnwood uh, Forest is the type area, and then the type species would be Charnia masoni, right? So there are other proposed species of Charnia as well. I think most of them have been subsumed into the species Charnia masoni because they were either junior synonyms or people have looked at them again and said, well, that's slightly different than that. And then in fact, there's even what people sometimes refer to as sister species or six sister genera uh, as well. So, so this, again, 
one more time, and I'm not going to follow the pattern, for, you know, this is not a scientific paper. This is just a presentation for you. <laughs> and so we're just going to call it Charnia masoni here. But as much as I can, I want to give you the specific name for each one of these. So Charnia masoni is a specific name for for that fossil right there, and that's the holotype. So that's what every Charnia should look like that. Every Charnia masoni should look like that as well. So that is Charnia masoni. Check this one out. This one's Charnio discus concentricus. This again, these are both Ediacaran fossils. They were shown to be late Precambrian in age. They predated the trilobites and other sorts of organisms that people recognized as being part of the Cambrian faunas that eventually are going to show up. But we didn't have fossils back then. We didn't have body fossils back then. In other words, we didn't have fossils that actually had shelly material on them. These are all soft body impressions and and uh, tracks and traces, in fact, some of them as well. So there's Charnio discus concentricus here. At the very end of that, you see the disc on that? Let me show you this. Um, first of all, we're going to look at this one. This is called a form taxon right here. This is called a rangemorph. And a rangemorph is the form taxa for something that's probably related to Charney as well. If you look at that, that's what those arms would probably have had on them when Charnia made it into the sediment and was impressed into the sediment and left behind its marks, in other words. So that is Pectinifrons species there. And because it's a form taxon, you don't give it a species name typically. But here's what most people think they are. They think that today these things would be represented by the sea pens. Well, the sea pens are a very primitive sort of cylinderate or cnidarian, if you will. Um, so sea pens live in the ocean. They have these sort of like uh, apparatus in order to trap things that are coming by. So eating protists and things like that. There are single-celled animals that may have been around in the in the water column. These things would actually get some of that material in order to make a living and metabolize and grow and live and do all the things that living things do. Those are some living sea pens right here. So it's easy to go back to see Charnio discus and say, wow, that's a sea pen right there. But rather than naming it after a living sea pen, you give it the name for the fossil material and where it came from in this case. So if that's one example of a Ediacaran fossil, here's some more. This is Cyclomedusa. Cyclo meaning circular or cyclic, if you will. And it looks a lot like a jellyfish, in fact. And so it looks, in fact, almost identical to a living. It's not really a jellyfish. It's a living medusoid. It's a medusoid that actually secretes something almost like plastic. They're about so big around, it's called porpita. You can go to Carolina Biological Supply and actually order a porpita. But they have this sort of like um, integument that is filled with air that allows them to float, essentially. And so when these things respirate, they actually float on the ocean, ocean surface. And then they have these tentacles that extend below to help them feed and make their living, right? So these things also would have fed off of protus and things like that. And that's the interpretation, in fact, for Cyclomedusa here. But if you go back once again and look at, at Charniodiscus, it's got a disc at the bottom, too. It sure looks like it could have been a medusoid as well, but instead it's sort of like got a polyp sort of aspect to its entirety, if you will. But people have thought maybe they popped off and left those sort of discs behind, and that may be what you see when you look at cyclodiscus here, cyclomedusa. Um, so other sorts of animals that you would see in the Ediacaran, this is an example right here, one of the more famous ones, and this is called Dickinsonia. People have studied Dickinsonia right and left, and what they see when they see this, that thing has a head. <laughs> you you look at that, and it's like, are you serious? That's got a head? Yeah, well, there's one end that's different from the other end. And so people have conjecture, anyway. They think that there may have been a primitive notochord that ran down the back, of that thing. Well, it's probably a cylinderate as well, or a cnidarian, but it had these sort of like filled passages, probably full of air, that would have allowed it to either float, or in this case, people think that these things actually were able to crawl, so they could have also been related to annelid worms, perhaps. And so, still with a, a cylinder, 
Cilinterado is the term that we use for things that have a, a hollow opening within them. And so this thing had some hollows, essentially, that filled with sediment in this case. That's Dickinsonia costata here. And I think that's the type species for Dickinsonia here from the Flinders Range. And it's absolutely stunningly beautiful, this, this fossil. It shows you that there were living things around back then. So here's a couple of trace fossils now. So, okay, we're looking at something called Philozoon. Hansen I, named after a Hansen who first found some of these things, that's the one that shows the ribbing that's a lot like Dickinsonia. So what if Dickinsonia would actually hit the sea, shallow sea floor and maybe crawl like a worm, right? It would leave maybe a track that's very similar to what you see with Philozoon. Um, Hans and I. The other one is pretty plain and it is at the bottom down here and it's flat essentially, right? And that's the Allozoon species. It's the smooth one at the bottom here. They're referred to as trace fossils. So trace fossils indicating a track or pathway that this animal would have left behind after it either crawled around on the surface or rested there or any other sort of activity that you can imagine an animal would do on the sea floor. That or these are a couple of ichno uh, species, essentially, right here, or at least ichno genera for the Allozoon. Um, so, okay, if you have enough paleontologists, if you have four paleont three paleontologists in a room, you'll get four different answers to most questions. So, um, in fact, people have proposed something they call the Pro Articulata for things like Dickinsonia and its in its cohorts here. So uh, Yorgia is one of these things, Yorgia wagneri. And so this actually had a sort of like pattern for laying on additional layers within this sort of like organization that Dickinsonia would have as well. Dipleurozoa, they, they've even divided it into three different types here. If you get into the literature, you're going to see that that the Ediacaran is not the only name that's been applied to these things. They've also been known as Vindian organisms or Vindia morph would be the shape of this sort of thing. They're found in Siberia. They're found in Britain. They're found anywhere you, where you have really, really old sedimentary rocks. And so in this case, here's this Proarticulata uh, that's here. And so this has been a proposed sort of phylum, essentially. So it'd be the overarching sort of thing in which you would put all of these things that look essentially like some sort of pneumatic uh, sort of animal, if you will. By the way, in Porpita, Porpita, the one that looks like Cyclomedusa, uh, that's called a pneumatophore. And so the pneumatophore is that floating disc that's made out of something a little bit like cartilage, in fact. And so you know, a little bit more sophisticated than just a sort of like... Uh, uh, surface membrane or anything like that. So a little bit thicker than that. So pretty tough, actually. In fact, today there are only two of those that are actually regarded. I think they call them, uh, uh, they're not tenophores. I, let's see, I'd have to, siphonophores. They're called siphonophores. So there are porpita, and then the other one's called velella. Velella, v uh, velella, velella, I think it is. And velella, velella is one of the coolest little animals you can imagine. Imagine having a little float like that that's a little bit elongate, right? So actually, Vellel is about so long, maybe three centimeters long, has a sail on the back. So it, would have not only, it, it not only floats in the ocean today, we know that, it also gets moved around by the wind. And there are left-handed ones and right-handed ones, in fact. And so some of them sail to the south and some of them sail to the north. And they're mostly at equatorial latitudes. But I've seen some, in fact, um, well, in the Pacific, they've actually measured where these things show up. And you'll often find them blown onto beaches and things like that. And so you'll see Velella blown up. And the, all that's left behind is that pneumatophore, or what was full of air at one time, and the sail that's left behind as well. So they're called by-the-wind sailors, in fact. So I know this because that was part of my, <laughs> my master's thesis when I was looking at Antarctic animals and things that looked a little bit like a, a pneumatophore. It turns out that they weren't. They were actually made out of shelly material instead. But it's not unlike some of these things here that you see, like Dickinsonia. You could easily think that that might have been a pneumatophore type of structure as well, full of air perhaps, with sort of like a, a chitinous, well, maybe a chitinous composition or, you know, like the, the stuff that makes bugs, okay, makes them crunch and so forth, um, with a little bit of a, uh, a coating on the outside and then maybe some tentacles underneath.
So that is one of the proposed phyla here. There are a lot of things that have that sort of unusual thumbprint sort of look to them here. This is Andiva Ivanta Sovi. Uh, so this is another one that has that same sort of aspect. Some of these have been interpreted before as being torn pieces of like a Dickinsonia, I think. But not so much this one, I'm pretty sure. So I think that one's actually um, pretty valid. But Chondroplon here has, has been referred to as a Dickinsonia that's actually just been ripped apart, perhaps. And, and a little bit more wave agitation may have, have disturbed its actual kind of may have been a little bit more... Uh, uh, you know, uh, not quite so hard, uh, easy to easy to rip and things like that. So fragile, I guess you could say. So that's chondroplon bilobatum, uh, bilobatum, and so uh, it's been referred to as Dickinsonia again. Here's another one that has something similar to that same look. This is uh, Archaeospinus fedonkia, uh, fedonkini. Uh, Fedonkin was a very famous uh, Soviet uh, paleontologist, and so he uh, he named a whole lot of things from the Siberian platform, in fact. And so um, really quite a, a specialized sort of like paleontologist specializing in many of these earliest faunas like this. This is Arca, Arcarua. This is actually from... The um, from Australia as well. This is Atomai, of course, was the species. Arcarua Atomai is the species here, and you can see that it has kind of a star shape to it. Um, there's a lot of convergent evolution that occurs on Earth, and that actually has a resemblance also to something we recognize today and something that's extinct, mind you, but it looks a little bit like a certain variety of, of a uh, echinoderm. And so a little bit like a crinoid, in fact, some crinoids, they have fivefold symmetry. And because, you, well, what do you look at when you try to make interpretations of these fossils, right? In this case, you look at the symmetry first. Well, it's got five on it. And so if you got five, it makes it easy to try to say it might be an echinoderm then. You put it in more elegant language than that, you know, but it's a, but when you're looking for the explanation, how do you explain this? It's like, well, you try to find the best example that you can or living things and then you or other fossils and try to work backwards then. This is one Tribrachidium uh, heraldicum and uh, so this is one that looks like it's got you now they call it what is it Tridisca it's the three legs and so forth it's a symbol for the Isle of Man in fact I'm not wearing my Isle of Man jacket today but uh, but three legs running essentially right so that is the symbol for the Isle of Man this, in fact, is has a three-fold symmetry in this case, not five-fold. So a little bit unusual, unusual. I can't tell you that any of these things look really normal, maybe other than the cyclomedusa. That's the simplest one, or maybe the ones that you can relate back to as sea pins, perhaps. But the rest of these things is like, wow, they just look different, don't they? Here's one... Uh, uh, per, okay, Parvan, Corina, Minchemai. Okay, so I have to like sound these things out. Parvan or Corina, Minchemai. So this is one that has a sort of like head region. And then it's got a, what seems to be like a axial lobe through the back of it. And people think that this would indicate that it's some sort of arthropod, in fact. Um, so like a trilobite sort of thing. This one's unusual here. Annulo ichnus, ichnus, uh, annulus ichnus. And so it is a round feature, like, like a whole series of uh, car rings, let's say, like, you know, you would put car keys on a ring, right? If you had a whole stack of those things and lined them up in the sediments, it would be hollow on the inside. But then on the outside, it would have sort of a hollow ring as well. And so just unusual sort of things that you see here. People have referred this to a trace fossil because you actually see some of the disks actually separated from one another. Probably not an echinoderm, in other words. Not like the, because echinoderms don't show up until you get into the Ordovician. Okay, so you don't find those very commonly. And, and you find eocrinoids and things like that, but nothing that's really sophisticated until you get into the Ordovician. So... Um, here's some unusual tubes. It looks like a whole stack of ice cream cones, if you will. That's called Cloudina. And Cloudina is unusual because it's named for Preston Cloud, that famous paleontologist who proposed that 
In fact, the uh, great oxygenation event was related to these banded iron formation. He's that guy. It looks like a whole stack of small, little tiny ice cream cones. You know, so if that's five millimeters, the entire length on a Cloudina may be only 10 millimeters in length, right? But at the whole thing, they're like uh, the external skeleton. So these are actually material that would have produced a skeleton. They don't find Cloudina until you get to the very end of the Ediacaran. So it's the beginning of skeletonization. Okay, so skeletons began to first appear roughly when Cloudina shows up. And so it's a pretty important fossil for that aspect. The other thing that's important about it is you find it in great quantities in some rocks. You'll find like whole layers of Cloudina. So they were something like early, early reefs. And uh, different reefs than what we would have had even in the lower Cambrian, and certainly much different from what we have today. But here we have something that is an indication of the first skeletons arriving. Here's the reconstruction for Cloudina, making it something like a worm. And so today we refer to these things as either serpulid worms or sabellid worms. And so you see things like the spear orbis is another variety. But these things would actually have a filter feeding apparatus on the head regions that would allow them to suck goodies out of the water column and then be able to feed off of that for the metabolism and reproduction. So that's Cloudina and its reconstruction. There's some other unusual things. Berkia hunti here is, a, people have referred to it, and you can kind of see the impression on the lower part of this. It's not the part that's um, that's solid up in here, but it's actually the, the impression on the lower part there, and you can see the, the pits in it, right? Those are probably openings. And so people have referred to this as potentially being a tunicate. And so tunicates are kind of related to sponges, if you will. So things that would have had an opening or like a vase sort of like shape where filter feeding would be important to them. And in fact, here's another one that's related to that, they think. And so um, this one's actually Ausia fenestrata over here. Fenestrate refers to the windows that are within it. And so that would allow currents to flow through it. But if a current is going over the top of that, it would draw water in through those windows, essentially, and then out the top and what you would have an X current sort of like flow out of that. And so you'd be able to, to strain some of the organisms as they would f uh, flow through there. And so maybe a little bit more sophisticated sort of animal that appeared during the Ediacaran, both the Ausia and the Burikai. Um, he, we're getting towards the end of these, okay, so I don't want to bore you too much, but in fact, I find these things absolutely fascinating. I hope you do too. These things like this, it looks something like a feathery worm, if you will, but it also has the appearance of a trilobite. And because of that, they think that this may be one of the earlier trilobites that didn't have a skeleton quite yet. And so it would put on segments, axial segments, that would allow it to crawl like a worm. And that's kind of what arthropods do today. And so this is Sprigaina flounder's eye. So flounder's eye is the Latinized version for Flinders range. And so that's what it's named for. And Sprigaina, of course, little uh, sprig, if you will. And so if we look at another reconstruction for what the Ediacaran would have looked like. You know, we're talking 700 million years ago. Everything before 540 million years ago, it would have looked very, very different from what we look at in the oceans today. There probably were jellyfishes. There probably were things like sea pins. And there may have been things even like Sprigaina that were a little bit like a worm crawling around that could pot potentially be a predator on other sorts of animals. But the predator's predation really wasn't around much as far as we can tell. Well, how do we know that? Most of the fossils that we see don't have any sort of injuries on them from what looks like a bite mark or anything like that. So maybe the mouths weren't, didn't have any art parts either. The only hard sort of like fossils that you find in rocks of this age are what we call acrotarchs. And acrotarchs we think are related to some of the earliest plant material that could have been around back then. And so those were the spore casings around the outside of spores. So acrotarchs. So if the Ediacaran was the beginning of life on this planet as we know it, kind of like the first flowering of multicellular animals, the real game starts.
when the Cambrian arises, and that's going to be called the Cambrian Explosion. That's coming just around the corner here. Before we get to the Cambrian Explosion, I want to give you a little presentation on fossils and fossilization, just a short one, and then we'll, and that's for the next exam. That'll be for the final exam in here, but, but for now, this will be the end for the test material for now. Anyway, thanks for your attention. And again, I'm sorry it takes me so long to put these things together, but it does take a long time to do these. And so here they are. And um, Friday, the exam is coming up. And so make sure you study the presentations for that and all the materials that were put forward for these uh, presentations. So yeah, try to stay uh, abreast of what's going on in here, either through announcements or through the emails that I send out. So that's coming right up here. So. Anyway, thanks again for your attention, and I hope you're enjoying these. Uh, I kind of enjoy putting them together because it's kind of an expertise that I've had for a long time that I really haven't got to share with very many people uh, because most of the time I teach other classes, but this is kind of cool. So the Ediacaran fauna here. When we get to the Cambrian, that's actually one of my specialties as well. Uh, I study what they call small shelly fossils in Cambrian strata from Antarctica. So we'll look at some of those. They're really kind of interesting. They're really armored worms. Um, so we're going to look at arthropods, armored worms, brachiopods, all sorts of weird can animals. Most of the most of the phyla actually show up in Cambrian time. So we're going to look at the Cambrian explosion. Anyway, thanks a lot. Talk to you soon.